The Ermac Centre is proud to present the SFU Fellows of the Royal Society of Canada Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts five presentations per semester. For the spring 2012 semester, the presenters belong to the Departments of Earth Sciences, English, Biological Sciences, Economics, and the School of Resource and Environmental Management. Today's speaker is Dr. John Clegg from the Department of Earth Sciences. So the, uh, the Royal Society of Canada is 130 years old. It was um, founded by the Marquis of Lorne, who was the Governor General of the time, and has enjoyed the patronage of subsequent Governors General. Uh, the Society was incorporated in 1883 by an Act of Parliament and has had, um, I would say, a good relationship with the government from that time. Um, the founder was inspired, I think, by the existence of the Royal Society in the UK and by the Institute de France. Now, the Royal Society, the real Royal Society, as you might say, is uh, an academy just of the natural sciences, whereas the Royal Society of Canada really embraces and um, recognizes by awarding fellowships all creative work of all kinds. So uh, it consists of three academies, the Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Academy of Social Sciences, and the Academy of Science. So it, it's much, much broader than the Royal Society of the UK. Uh, it has about 1,800 fellows at the moment. Now, I think uh, I'd just like to mention one thing that the Royal Society does, and that is um, it creates, uh, in conjunction with government, expert panels which um, make reports on some of the very important issues of the day. Two of the recent ones I'd just like to mention uh, uh, end of life decision making. They produced a report on that. And the one before that was environmental and health impacts of Canada's oil sands industry. So you can see that uh, they are, I think, assisting the whole country by producing these reports on issues that are of importance to everyone in Canada. So I'd like to leave it at that and hand it over to, back to Vaseline. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, next I would like to uh, invite Professor Brent Ward from Earth Sciences to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Um, there will be a recording, so please. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you. Um, John is, uh, is the premier quaternary geologist in Canada. Um, he, uh, and Canada is actually lucky to have him. Um, and for that, we can thank American Foreign Policy. Uh, John came here in 1969 from California to start a PhD at uh, UBC. Uh, he finished that uh, PhD in 1973 and was immediately hired by the Geological Survey of Canada because they knew that he was uh, an excellent scientist. So he spent the majority of his career here in Vancouver working um, in the Cordilleran office. Um, his research is focused on the Canadian Cordillera where he has become the undisputed expert in natural hazards, glacial history, and the geomorphic evolution of British Columbia and uh, Yukon. Uh, John is incredibly productive. I, you know, he's probably has several hundred publications. But, you know, just to give you an idea, his last NSERC, he had 50 publications. 50. So, I mean, that's like many people's entire career, just in one NSERC application. Um, John really enjoyed the survey. Um, he was there for many years. Uh, but he wanted to branch out and become more involved in student training. 
And so in 1998, he came here to SFU as a SHRUM chair, which was then followed by a, a CRC tier one chair. Um, so John is very active with students. He has very high enrollment courses. He has lots of undergraduate students doing undergrad theses, lots of MSCs, lots of PhDs, and all these, uh, all these people he actually goes to the field uh, with, which I find um, amazing. Um, so another aspect of John is uh, his dedication to public education for earth sciences. He uh, spends an inordinate amount of time producing public uh, interest books and posters along with numerous public lectures to all kinds of different groups. And he's also a, a very common uh, contributor to the media. In fact, many of the media here have him on speed dial. So if there's some sort of a natural hazard that happens locally or internationally, you likely hear John talking about it on, on both local and national media. Um, I've only got two minutes, so I'm, I'm going to kind of round it off here. Uh, not only is he a member of the Royal Society, he's also been president of the Geological Association of Canada, and he's also been president of, of the International Quaternary Association, and he's also heavily involved in Canqua. So, so John really covers the gamut for Earth Sciences, and so I'm looking forward to today's talk on another topical issue. Do I have to use this, this thing? With my voice? Oh, yeah, I've got the left one, of course. Uh, OK, thank you. That was very kind of you, Brent. I really appreciate that. Um, as you will probably note it from my abstract, I'm going to talk about sea level and sea level change. The first part of the talk is interesting, but kind of maybe non-controversial science. And then I drift off into doom and gloom, you know. So um, some of my students call me Dr. Doom, and it's probably warranted, as you'll see, as you walk out kind of wondering, oh my god, the world's coming to an end. But anyway, it's, it's an interesting topic. And so let me just give you a synopsis of what I'll be uh, covering. Um, just start with a little introduction. Um, talk about uh, how uh, geologists such as Brent and myself actually look at past uh, records of sea level. How do we know that sea level has changed in the past? And then consider uh, some of the myriad of factors that actually affect sea level. Um, I think uh, we don't, most people don't realize that sea level is uh, constantly changing and it's changing as a result of an interplay of many, many factors. In this presentation, I'm just going to be touching on the main ones that would be of interest on timescales, human timescales. I'm not going to talk about shifting plates and how they inter affect sea level, because although it's interesting from an Earth history point of view, it's not particularly relevant in terms of the issues that I'm going to be dealing with, or, which is really where sea levels are heading over the course of the remainder of this century. And then uh, give you a sense for uh, what we know about uh, what sea level is doing now. Um, is it stable? Is it going up? Is it going down? Uh, we, we have technology now that allows us to actually detect very small sea level changes on the order of millimeters per year, which we didn't have 20 or 30 years ago. So we're in a better position to actually take the pulse of the Earth in terms of uh, sea level change. And then, uh, this is where I get a bit on the gloomy side, talk about sea levels in the future. It's not a guarantee what I, you know, my doom and gloom may not be fully warranted, but uh, most scientists would agree that we are sort of in a dangerous situation and that um, this is yet another reason that we should uh, be dealing with uh, greenhouse gases. Okay, so. As I mentioned, sea level hasn't been stable. It's fluctuated wildly um, through relatively short periods of geologic time. Uh, sea level has ranged from up to six meters above its present level to as much as 150 meters below its present level, just within the last 125,000 years. Now, I know that seems like a long time, but actually, in terms of total geologic time, that's just a drop in the bucket. And these are large changes. You can imagine sea levels being 150 meters below what they are today and kind of the consequences of that in terms of just Earth geography. 
and uh, its impact on plants and animals, which I'll touch on in a moment. Turning to the next topic after that brief introduction, let's look at some of the indicators. It's just a real high-level look at them, at these indicators of past sea levels. Uh, these are two examples of indicators of sea levels that are, were higher at one time than today. You can see these uh, kind of linear, almost worm-like tracks. These are just the former shorelines of the sea when the sea was higher than it is today. They're raised beaches, and we find these um, in the high Arctic. We find them around Hudson Bay, uh, where they're very well preserved because they're not covered by trees. Um, this is another example from New Zealand, where you can see three very conspicuous, or four very conspicuous former shorelines that increase in elevation uh, as you move higher in, in, uh, inland from the coast. These particular beaches were the products of very large earthquakes, the most recent of which is historic. It occurred around 1850 near Wellington, New Zealand, but the others are as well. So there's a little story captured in these particular beaches. Really one of the most important developments in earth science in terms of understanding past sea levels has been uh, the archive of ice cores that have been collected from our big continental ice sheets, the existing continental ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. And these cores uh, have something approaching annual layering. They are annually layered. As you go back in time, you begin to get a little bit of uh, uncertainty as to where you are. There's some plus or minus as where you are in time. But they offer this tremendous high resolution record of Earth history. And we now know that ice in Antarctica and Greenland actually extends back, existing ice exists back almost a million years. We have 800,000 year record of ice. And you might say, well, big deal. So it's annually resolved. But the important thing is that these are capturing or archiving past climate in several ways. Um, geochemically, they're capturing it. Um, they trap ice bubbles that capture the atmosphere as it existed back in time, back to 800,000 years ago. So we can use these as proxies for past environments, for past climatic conditions. And it's been very important in terms of understanding sea levels. So one of the uh, geochemical archives is uh, the ratio between two isotopes of oxygen that we get in the atmosphere. A lighter isotope, by far the most common, oxygen-16, and then a heavy isotope of uh, oxygen-18. There's also an, a third isotope, oxygen-17, but the key ones are these two. And the important thing here is that as water evaporates, as it uh, goes into the vapor state in the ocean, you get a fractionation so that there's a tendency, the kinetics are such that the heavier isotope, oxygen-18, is sort of left behind relative to the lighter isotope. And thus you can imagine that if you could have a recorder of that isotope ratio in the oceans, uh, that you might actually begin to understand how much water there was in the oceans back through time. Uh, because you're going to get a preferential increase in O18 relative to O16 as the amount of water in the oceans decreases. And why would that happen? You build big ice sheets. Also, while that's happening, you get a distillation or a fractionation of those isotopes as the vapor precipitates out. So during a glacial period, you typically have, uh, you have very uh, enriched O16 in ice relative to O18, and the opposite in the oceans, where O18 is distilled or fractionated or concentrated. So that isotope ratio within the ice cores that are collected gives you a global sense for where sea level was at any given time, subject to the imprecisions of knowing where you are in time. So having said that, and I'll return to that point because it's an important one in kind of looking at the relationship between greenhouse gases and uh, climate. In, a, in the sort of global average sense. So I'm going to be returning to that point a little later on. 
But what are some of the factors that affect sea level? Um, some of them will be obvious to you, others might not be. Um, of course, we have tides. There's the gravitational effects of the moon and the sun. This is almost an overriding factor because around Vancouver, we have a tidal range of five meters. And as I'll point out later on, why worry about 20 or 30 centimeters of sea level rise when you're dealing with this ridiculous range and tides that kind of almost span the width of this room? Um, but it is important, even within that context of a large tidal range. So that's a primary influence on sea level, and it's a, it's a diurnal effect. It goes up and down and up and down. It's a short-term change in sea level, and local as well. Uh, we have, sea level can be impacted by uh, large scale, sort of subcontinental scale, oceanic scale, changes in ocean circulation and in, um, and in atmospheric circulation. I'm sure you're aware of the INSO or El Nino phenomenon. That actually has an impact on sea level on our coast. Our sea level, sort of over a period of months to a year can differ one to two meters just due to what's happening in the subtropics. Um, it is cyclic, it's not a long-term change, but it does have a local impact uh, on a kind of a continental scale. And then we have a very important one, uh, the one that kind of we're worried about, and these are global changes in sea level. It's called eustostasy, that's where uh, sea level rises and falls globally because of some uh, kind of exchange of water between the oceans and the continents. And the obvious large scale player in that would be the ice sheets. So today, if we were to remove all the ice on Earth, put that water into the ocean, sea level would be about 65 to 70 meters higher than it is today. Clearly, we don't want that to happen. And it hasn't happened for tens of millions of years. So is it possible it could happen? Anything's possible. I think that's pretty, pretty unlikely. And then we have what are called steric effects. These are uh, the effects of salinity and temperature on the volume of a fluid. Um, so as I'll show you, uh, water will expand as it gets warmer uh, within a certain range. And this is a contributor to present day sea level rise, or these steric effects. And then isostatic effects are just due to the loading or unloading of the crust. Um, you know, our planet has isostatic adjustment, essentially. The geoid is such that where you have an unusually thick uh, crust, um, you know, typically mountains extend high above the surface. Where you have a thin crust, that might not be the case. So there's, if you were to kind of alter the local configuration of the crust, you can actually alter land level and thus alter sea level in the same process. Sediment loading, I just mentioned this because in areas where we get rivers entering the sea, we typically have very thick piles of loose water saturated sediment that are compressible. Uh, an example would be the Fraser River Delta, Richmond. There are up to 250 meters of loose sand, silt, and clay highly water saturated, it could be compressed. And if you compressed and lower the sur compress those materials and lower the surface, you're effectively changing the level of the sea relative to the land on a local scale. Another local to regional player is tectonic uplift or subsidence. As mountains rise, you can imagine coastlines are experienced in a relative sea level fall. Think of it in a relative sense because it's just the position of the sea relative to the land. That's what a shoreline is. Earthquakes can have the same effect, but instantaneously, you can change the level of the land in, in extreme cases by up to 10 meters within a minute. Um, so a shoreline uh, could become 10 meters above sea level um, essentially in a minute if you have a very large earthquake. Or Crust could also drop, and a surface could drown by that amount in an extreme case. And then groundwater extraction. This is something we don't think much about, but that's actually today an important contributor of sea level rise, and I'll show you that in a moment. OK, so let's just walk through a couple of these examples. I mentioned um, INSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, it's a setup. I won't go into the details. 
that relates to uh, trade wind strength in the equatorial Pacific and the interaction of those um, atmospheric winds with uh, ocean temperature. So what this shows is uh, temperature deviations here from an average. Think of it that way. And in an El Nino setup, you typically have very warm equatorial Pacific waters um, that play out right across the Pacific, actually. You get uh, consequences of that setup um, as far north as British Columbia. And likewise, the opposing state, the La Nina state, these are kind of alternating uh, states. When you have uh, cooler than average temperatures in the equatorial Pacific, you get a different setup in the North Pacific. Um, this affects not only sea level, but it affects weather as well. You probably heard forecasters predicting we were have, going to have a La Nina year this year. Well, it didn't play out, so um, I don't know how they're going to explain that exactly. But normally, you do get important effects of those equatorial Pacific uh, setups on our climate. I mentioned uh, gravitational effects of the moon and the sun. Now, clearly, uh, these are overriding factors, but in a sense, do they, do they really matter? We, we have a kind of a society and infrastructure that's adapted to this predictable cyclic range between high and low tides, uh, seasonal changes in, the, in the, the strengths of the tides related to gravitational effects of the, the moon and the sun. Um, they're large. In Vancouver, the tidal range is about five meters. Um, so this, in a sense, kind of is much, much larger. It's an order of magnitude larger than the, the long-term changes in sea level that I'm going to be talking about. But I'm going to try to show you that it's those long-term changes that are, although smaller, are really uh, of great concern to us. So that's another player in this game, or just the, uh, the tidal fluctuations that uh, the longer-term changes are superimposed on. And then uh, I mentioned global sea level. Um, uh, and again, I, I mentioned it in the context of an issue of important to us, and that's the, the relationship between the amount of glacier ice uh, on land and the amount of water in the seas. And uh, nearly all of Earth's ice is locked up into our three big ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet and the West and East Antarctic ice sheets. Um, by far and away, almost all uh, Earth's fresh water in ice is uh, locked up in, in those big ice sheets. Um, so there's an equilibrium that's established. It's closely related to climate. Um, as climate warms, there might be a tendency for uh, these glaciers, the ice sheets, to melt uh, for that water, melted water, to return to the oceans, which will drive sea level up. Um, but, of course, this is compensated in a negative feedback loop by precipitation of snow that eventually transforms into ice that doesn't actually immediately return to the ocean basins. So there's an equilibrium that um, is perturbed by changes in climate. Uh, and it really requires remarkably little change in climate uh, to perturb that system. These are very sensitive, paleo they're very sensitive thermometers, in a sense, glaciers. And that's why so much work has been done on trying to understand the, the impacts of climate on glaciers. So we know that as recently as about 18,000 years ago, that much of the north latitudes of North America were covered by a large ice sheet including the Vancouver area, where we had up to two kilometers of ice above us here at that time. Also, northern Europe, parts of uh, Eurasia, and Finno-Scandia were covered by a fairly large mass of ice. And kind of we see, if we go back in time, if you think of those glacial periods when we had li large ice sheets as the low spots on this, the, the more blue pattern, that there's a cyclic pattern of those ice sheet periods, what we call ice house state conditions, going back well over a million years, probably to about two and a half million years ago, and that they were uh, inter, 
interleaved, if you will, with periods when climate was much like it is today, or at least was more temperate than it is today. And we today live in an unusual time. We live in an interglaciation when it's been almost as warm as it has in any time in the past two and a half million years. So we're in kind of unusual waters in a sense because the more normal condition is not up here. It's somewhere either down here or somewhere in between. And why does this matter? Well, back when we had the last big interglaciation, which is well documented geologically, 125,000 years ago, um, under conditions somewhat similar to what we have today, sea level was six meters higher than it is today. Um, the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets were smaller. There was more water in the oceans. Think about if sea levels were six meters higher, were higher in the day. Think about if you live in Richmond and you had sea levels six meters higher in the day. You wouldn't be living in Richmond. And this is remarkable because at that time when the last ice sheets existed, we had a paleogeography on Earth that was radically different from what it is today. Um, these are some of the consequences of the drawdown in the oceans due to the locking up of ice on land. Um, this one shows the linkage between Australia and New Guinea, but there were also uh, land bridges between major continental bodies, big islands and continents, other than this. Another one that's really important in terms of, uh, of paleoecology and the migration of plants and animals is what's referred to as the Beringian, the Bering, uh, the land bridge that connected uh, Alaska and Siberia. This entire area, which is now submerged, was a land area as recently as about 12,000 years ago. And I include this just to show you what happened when those ice sheets disappeared. Uh, sometime around here, climate switched from a glacial to an interglacial state, and sea levels rose, and they rose very fast. It was punctuated by these extraordinarily rapid small rises in sea level. Um, it wasn't just a monotonic linear trend of rising sea level as the ice sheets wasted. Um, and Really, this inflection in the curve when sea level approaches zero is obviously the time that the last big ice sheet, the Laurentide ice sheet, uh, finally disappeared about 7,000 years ago. And since then, we've lived in the ideal perfect world where sea level has changed very little. Civilization has developed because along in coastal areas, because we can and have assumed for thousands of years that sea level is static. We assume that it's not going to change. Um, whereas if you happen to live in this period, you might think otherwise. Most of the biblical tales, uh, the Red Sea tales, you know, the opening of the, the Red Sea, or possibly the flooding of the Black Sea, are linked to probably myths or something approaching uh, a myth that relate to this period of sea level rise, where peoples were migrating because shorelines were were moving inland as sea level rose. So just to really rapidly carry on through this, this just shows the density of water as a function of temperature. And I include this just to show that if you have warmer water, that water, all other things being equal, will occupy a lot more space. So as oceans warm, particularly the upper parts of the ocean columns that are most sensitive to warming, um, they expand. How do they expand? They move up, so sea level rises as a result of, uh, of this warming effect that's linked in to um, the impact of temperature on the volume of that, of that fluid. Isostasy, um, it can affect sea level on a fairly large scale, on a subcontinental scale. And I mentioned that, it's just the equilibrium between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, if you will, something approaching the crust and the mantle. The mantle has a lower viscosity than the crust. The crust is more brittle, so it kind of loads into the mantle. And if you load the mantle, it tends to move very slowly away from the point of loading. And that affects the level of the land over kind of subcontinental scales. It's not just tectonics that do that. Ice sheets do that as well. So we know that when these big ice sheets existed, they loaded the crust. In fact, our ice sheet, the Cordilleran ice sheet, 
loaded, lowered the crust when it was fully in equilibrium by probably about 500 meters. So the crust was lowered by that amount just due to that uh, isostatic effect of the ice and the movement of material very slowly in this, uh, this non-brittle uh, plastic material below. So we have as a result of that uh, a loaded crust when glaciers disappeared from this area and relative sea levels because the land was lowered that were higher than they are today. So at this time, about 13,000 years ago, Simon Fraser would be sitting on an island on the top of a hill that was essentially an island in an embayment that extended up to about Alder Grove and Abbotsford. Of course, once you remove the load, the, the crust responds, it comes up. So the whole point of this is that this is a player in changing sea levels. And this is still going on, not in our part of the world, but uh, Hudson Bay, much of central and eastern Canada are still responding to the removal of those ice sheets on a scale of up to about a centimeter per year. Uh, the areas around Hudson Bay are rising currently at the rate of about a centimeter per year uh, due to the removal of ice that occurred 8 to 10,000, 12,000 years ago. The classic example of the impact of sediment loading on sea level is that in the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, this is a really thick pile. We like to think the Fraser River is big, but the amount of sediment locked up in the, in the Mississippi R River Delta is huge. And it's one of the factors that probably uh, result in New Orleans being below sea level and why they have to protect it from things like hurricanes is that it, that surface is continually decreasing in elevation. If you think about it, if that's a significant enough metric that it compounds a problem in the future of the impacts of severe storms on that city. One could argue, is that really where you want to put people, you know, some five meters below sea level on the track of hurricanes that come in every few decades, but whatever. Who am I to say? Um, tectonic effects. So I mentioned uplift and subsidence that occur slowly over long time scales. Um, we also can have changes that are abrupt. This is an example of a former rock cut platform that was out, you know, just offshore a thousand years ago that got elevated instantly during an earthquake that occurred at Seattle a thousand years ago. You can't quite see it, but this is on Bainbridge Island, uh, which is just west of the city of Seattle. The bad actor in that event was this fault that produced an earthquake that elevated this surface about seven meters. So um, there were probably some nice bivalves on this surface a thousand years ago. Suddenly they're sucking air seven meters above sea level. We kind of have to worry about this because we're in a period when sea level is changed, changing due to the interaction between the tectonic plates that lie off our coast. Uh, Vancouver Island is being slowly uplifted because the plate boundary beneath it is locked and accumulating strain that's going to be released in one of these magnitude 9 earthquakes in the next few hundred years. And that's going to reverse this pattern of compression. You get extension, subsidence. During an event like that, the land surface can drop up to two meters uh, along our coast, not in Vancouver, but along the outer coast of Vancouver Island and along the Pacific coast of Washington and Oregon. Okay, so I'm going to close off on this little segment just to show you what can happen. This is the footprint of land level change that occurred during the last mega quake in Alaska in 1964. Um, there were offshore islands that were uplifted almost 10 meters. Uh, shorelines rose, uh, fell 10 meters as a result of uplift of the land. And then in areas more inboard, closer to Anchorage, the land surface subsided one to two meters. So groundwater extraction, I actually hadn't realized this until recently. There's a paper re uh, published a few months ago that uh, quantified the removal of groundwater um, and essentially its ultimate um, uh, repositioning into the oceans. You know, if you think about it, 
uh, you use groundwater for variety of purposes, but it ultimately all ends up back in the oceans. And that is responsible for about 25% of the current sea level rise, is just groundwater extraction. Now that would be compensated to some extent by the fact that we store a lot of water on land. There's a huge amount of water that's stored in reservoirs. So those two factors sort of operate in opposite directions. But sea level could be rising significantly just due to uh, groundwater extraction from the crust. It's not the effect on the crust, it's just the water that's locked up below the surface. It's being placed back into the ocean basins. So let me turn now uh, to what we know about what sea level is doing. Um, I mentioned the satellite technology that's developed over the past 20 years, which gives us a very precise estimate of what's happening to sea level on time scales of, or sorry, on uh, rates of millimeters per year. And there's been a fairly consistent uh, increase in sea level of about 3.32 or 3.3, say, millimeters per year, which is thought to be larger than it was about 50 years ago when estimates of about two millimeters a year were being bantied around. And just to point out that IPCC 2007 um, forecast that sea levels would rise at a lower rate than that. So their projections of where sea level will be at the end of the century are based on lower rates than we are currently seeing. Um, in other words, the problem may be more severe than we think. But again, I know you're thinking, big deal, three millimeters per year, that's chump change, you know. But think about over 100 years, that's, if the rates were at current values, that would be 30 centimeters. So, you know, that's more measurable, more tangible. And that assumes that this is a linear curve. And we have every reason to believe it's not going to be linear. Having said that, it's important to realize that sea level change is not the same everywhere. This is a map that shows uh, how sea level has changed over a short period of time. I don't really remember the period, but you can see that uh, there are areas where the rate of rise is higher than in other areas. There are even areas where it's either stable or maybe even decreasing slightly. And this is due to that myriad of other factors, particularly these ocean atmosphere interactions that are taking place. But on the whole, you see kind of a pattern of sea level rise almost everywhere. So that's a take home message, I suppose, there. So what might happen in the future? Well, there are some troubling signs. And we've known for a long time, and the reason I kind of got into this, was that glaciers, tempered glaciers, alpine glaciers, such as we have in Northwest North America, are really thinning, wasting, and retreating. Uh, today, many glaciers in uh, Western Canada and Alaska are, have about two-thirds of the volume, one-half to two-thirds of the volume of ice that they did 100 years ago. And this is clearly linked to uh, what you might consider a modest increase in global temperature. Now, remember, these curves that you've seen, though, are global averages. And it turns out that you have larger increases in temperature over this period in high mountains and at high latitudes. These are the areas that are being really most impacted by this warming trend that we've seen over the last century. But these are very large amounts. These are uh, lowerings of glacier surfaces that range, the scale ranges from minus 12 to plus 4. And these are large glaciers. It's thought that the loss of ice just in Northwest North America is contributing about a millimeter per year to that global average of three millimeters. But if you removed all that ice, all the ice from Northwest North America, you deglaciate the whole continent. Um, if you remove all the ice from the Andes, all the ice from the Himalayas, sea level wouldn't go up more than about a meter, maybe two at most. So, you know, in a way, although they're beautiful, it wouldn't be a catastrophe so much if we just lost ice from those environments uh, in terms of sea level. Um, but you can see it not only in Northwest North America, you can see it all around the world. These are two snapshots of the north side of Mount Everest uh, showing the glaciers as they existed in 1921 and 2008. And you can kind of see where some of these lines are and see the amount of lowering of the ice that's occurred 
in that system. So it's a global effect. You know, it's not just limited to Northwest North America. Probably a, a really wonderful example is Glacier Bay in Alaska. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1941 of Muir Glacier. Another photograph taken at exactly the same place. You can reference that line there as being this line, 2004. Now, that's an extreme example. You've lost hundreds of kilo cubic kilometers of ice just from Glacier Bay alone, which is a little bit unusual, but exemplomatic of what's happening to our glaciers. But it's really, I want to focus more on what's happening to the ice sheets. And this is really a subject of active research. And as you might imagine, tremendous concern. Greenland has about six or seven meters of water equivalent in it, meaning that if you lost that ice, sea level would rise six or seven meters. And it's been showing some very disturbing trends of late, which you've probably heard about. We're getting a lot more discharge of ice um, through outlet glaciers into the North Atlantic than we have earlier in this century. So these are um, sort of mass balances, gains, uh, losses versus gains a lot of the entire ice sheet is estimated over this period from 1958 to 2007. And you can see almost entirely throughout this period there's been a net loss. You've had a negative mass balance that's accelerated in recent years. And that's been accompanied by the fringe of the ice sheet experiencing more melting than it has in the past. And the two are linked because water derived from the melting along the periphery of the ice sheet is finding its way into, into the base of the glacier and accelerating the outflow from the ice into the oceans. So it's a short period of time. It's just a troubling, troubling sign. And we're not talking about small amounts of ice, 1,200 cubic kilometers uh, lost from the ice sheet over that five-year, six-year period. So that's a bit of a, a problem. And when we turn to Antarctica, which has about 65 meters of water equivalent, now that ice sheet isn't going to disappear in this century. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But it is showing some troubling signs. The Antarctic ice sheet is buttressed uh, both east and west Antarctic ice sheets are buttressed by ice shelves. These are large bodies of floating ice that kind of anchor ice streams flowing off the continent and prevent an acceleration of glaciers out into the sea. And this is one of the larger ones. It's, it's right up here in this corner here. Um, and I want to show you what happened in 2002 following a particularly a uh, strong period of climate warming. So just keep an eye on that. And you can see that that ice shelf is calving back into the sea. There's a very large amount of ice that's being lost over a period of months. And how large a, a mass of ice is that? That's an overprint of the state of Rhode Island on that ice shelf. So this is a big, this is not contributing to sea level rise, by the way. This is floating ice. The point I'm trying to make here is that um, it's a sign that, you know, these ice sheets are under stress, perhaps due to uh, climate change. Okay, so here's why I get a bit gloomy, because uh, everyone knows that concentrations of greenhouse gases, methane and carbon dioxide in particular, have been increasing uh, ever since the Industrial Revolution, um, and there's been an acceleration in the last 50 years, and we can document those changes from observations that are made out in the Pacific on the island of Hawaii. Before that, we had ice core data. Uh, we essentially were m measuring carbon dioxide in bubbles in the ice that gave us a very accurate uh, picture of what the concentration of CO2 was in the atmosphere. and. Um, you know, you look at those trends, uh, the modeling, and, you know, I'm a big IPCC advocate. I believe the scientists when they make these scenarios and look at the radiative forcing of greenhouse gases and come up with a range of possible uh, kind of trends in climate over the remainder of this century uh, in terms of the global warming that might be expected, the average global warming. And remember that what we've seen in the last 100 years has been a product of less than one, one degree Celsius of climate change. So 
this particular curve is assumes that concentrations are fixed at their year, year 2000 values. Um, that's not the case. They're much higher now than they were in 2000. There's no way they're going to be at 2000 year levels for quite some time. Um, and then we can also put this in a geologic context. This is what I'd like to do. Here we are. We're actually up at 390 now, I believe. Uh, 390 parts per million. That's parts per million. It doesn't seem like a lot, but you know, it's 0.4 parts per thousand. That seems like a lot to me of a radiative gas. Um, higher than they've been for well over a million years, maybe millions of years for all we know. Um, this graph, coming back to those ice cores, this is based on the ice core record. So we have a proxy here for temperature based on the oxygen isotope ratios that I mentioned earlier. And then we have measurements of the carbon dioxide in gases trapped in the ice. And what we see is this lockstep behavior back hundreds of thousands of years. These two things, temperature and carbon dioxide, are intimately linked. They're in a dance with one another. Now, there's a lot of argument about what's driving what. But if you assume that the carbon dioxide is driving global temperatures, then we have huge problems. Because we're up here in uncharted territory. We've never experienced that. You could argue that the whole system is completely out of equilibrium and will return to equilibrium with the loss of a lot of ice and a rise in sea level. This is just a simple plot that shows where sea level is today, zero, zero, where it was 20,000 years ago at the peak of the last glaciation, where it was in the Pliocene, and where it was in the super warm Eocene about 40 million years ago. This is what IPCC projects, a one meter rise in sea level. But it's based on this assumed temperature, global average temperature. But it, the Pliocene would tell us, uh-uh, you know, sea level could be a lot higher than that. It could be many tens of meters higher than that. If the system were in equilibrium, it's not in equilibrium. So the question is going to be how it's going to reestablish an equilibrium and over what sort of time period will that happen? So let's look at some likely scenarios. I'm going to take a very conservative IPCC uh, projection of about a half a meter, say even 30 centimeters of sea level rise, 40 to 60 here. So we have these South Pacific Island nations. Uh, by the end of the century, almost for sure, gone. You know, those people are going to have to resettle somewhere else because those island nations are so close to sea level there's no room for adaptation. Adaptation is basically leave, find some other place to live. With a one meter rise in sea level, you have more serious consequences. This is a projection of what Charleston, South Carolina would look like if it weren't defended with a one, millimeter, with a one meter rise in sea level. These are plausible. They're getting up to the range that most scientists would say, eh, maybe, but maybe not. A one meter inundation, were it not for the wonderful diking system that the Dutch have, would flood most of northern Netherlands, including all the large cities. Schiphol, the Amsterdam airport, is eight meters below sea level, by the way. So that's why the Dutch take this problem very seriously. You know, they're not going to let this happen. They'll defend to the bitter end in a rising sea level environment. And then just to have a little fun. A worst case scenario is six meters. There's not really much you can do about that. You just hope this isn't locked into what we're doing to climate now, because it would be a big problem. Um, entire countries would be flooded. Uh, Vietnam, Bangladesh are particularly vulnerable. But of course, uh, this would impact all coastal areas. And when you think about the number of people that live along the shoreline today, it has a huge impact. So these are increases of in the range of six, six meters. Florida, bless its soul, is going to lose a lot of land. And the eastern seaboard of the US would be, be heavily impacted. But every place would be impacted. And then I just uh, running out of time here, so I've got to shut down. But you know, we typically think that climate changes slowly. And so uh, there's some sort of lead time built in that we can react to all this. 
but uh, you know, chemists, physicists uh, would know well that systems can uh, be non-linear, that you can have thresholds when a system jumps from one state into another. So in terms of the stability of our ice sheets, there's not, you know, you don't necessarily have to think of that as being a linear kind of gradual decrease in the amount of ice. That could, you may possibly cross a threshold when something changes, like the ice shelves buttressing the Antarctic ice sheet that basically create a, um, a I get this right, yeah, positive feedback loop that could exacerbate the problem. We know this has happened. Geologists know this has happened. There was a period at the end of the last glaciation that we call the Younger Dryas when climate went from essentially something close to an interglacial state back into a full glacial state in the North Atlantic, perhaps in as little as a few years. A remarkably sudden change. Um, and it popped back out of that equally rapidly. So. Um, Albeit that that's an unusual setup, you know, when you're talking about large ice sheets melting quickly, um, there is conceivably the possibility where we could enter a nonlinear uh, setup where you cross thresholds. So just to close off with what are the impacts of sea level rise, and you know, they're obvious, coastal erosion and inundation. And uh, they're both important players today, even with uh, sea levels more or less stable. Um, you get severe coastal erosion in some geologic materials. Um, you get inundation in others. Uh, we have a coast where parts are more vulnerable to erosion than others. Much of the Vancouver Island coast is susceptible to erosion. The rocky shorelines of the mainland, less so. And uh, some of the uh, shorelines around Metro Vancouver being highly vulnerable to erosion. Inundation. Um, inundation wouldn't necessarily be gradual. What happens is, in a rising sea level regime, it's the extreme events that cause all the damage. So it's kind of the catastrophic, unusual, 100-year storms that erode the shoreline when sea levels are higher or inundate low-lying areas when sea levels are higher. So it's not just a monotonic, gradual incursion of the sea into low-lying areas. It's the extreme events that cause tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of damage in an area. Something to think about when we're dealing with uh, 250,000 people living less than one meter above mean sea level. Some of you probably live in Richmond where you live very close to mean sea level and you are defended by levees that border uh, populated areas, particularly Richmond. So how do we deal with this problem? What, how can we adapt or perhaps lessen the problem. Well, basically, you can defend or retreat military strategy. You know, it's the same thing. You know, when you're waging a war, you're either going to defend or you're going to retreat. And unfortunately, both of them are not very desirable options. Because when you say retreat, that means you're abandoning your gazillions of dollars of infrastructure along the shoreline moving inland. That's not desirable. So the natural tendency is to want to defend. But defending costs very large amounts of money. Even small little bits of coastline. The Museum of Anthropology out at UBC was an example. They defended that by armoring the shoreline at a cost of seven million dollars. Less, you know, just a kilometer or two of the shoreline. So you can think of that on a global scale. If sea level were 50 centimeters higher, how much money would you have to defend, uh, spend to defend a shoreline? So not very good options. Um, so the real problem and the real solution is we've got to, damn it, we've got to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And I would say um, we're clearly not, you know, we're using more and more hydrocarbons. I mean, there, there hasn't really been a decrease in that. And there's no sign that that's going to happen for quite some time. So we're not just at 390 parts per million, we're heading for something closer to 450 or 500. And that is a truly scary proposition in my mind. So before we have to do reduce our reliance on hydrocarbons, but in my mind, we have to also capture them. And there you know, is some promising technology that uh, would allow us to do that. I don't think we should continue to use the atmosphere as a dump. 
And I think I view the atmosphere as being used as a dump for carbon dioxide. So um, I think it's interesting that we are living in this time and we're, we're really um, kind of conducting this fantastic, well, not fantastic, it's kind of scary experiment uh, by altering our atmosphere um, with a poor understanding of the overall consequences of that and the time scale over which it will occur. Um, so I like, I heard this once at a talk, I'd say, how lucky do you feel? You know, do you want to continue um, kind of with our current strategy of dealing with this problem, if you want to call it dealing with it, or maybe we should consider taking some more, uh, you know, proactive measures to reduce or at least to slow down the increase in carbon dioxide emissions. So thank you very much. I think that's basically all I have. Questions, please. Please use the mic because we are uh, just fundamentally, we now have uh, means of measuring sea level using satellites. Yeah, with grace. What is the zero datum? What is sea level? Because you didn't yeah. mention anything about that. Yeah, well, I, I think it, what they do is they integrate observations over large areas. So they wouldn't rely on just a point like a tide gauge does. Um, but they're they're sensing the surface over large areas with you know large numbers of pixels and then comparing images over different time periods and sort of averaging those values but you're absolutely right you know um, globally sea level is is not a you know it's a it's a, a shifting kind of thing it's really hard to define what sea level is zero data well the the zero data ideally would be the geoid you know, which is kind of the gravitational, um, you know, average for the Earth. Um, so that's the average. And, but of course, the geoid uh, differs considerably. I mean, if you look at sea level uh, in parts of the Southwest Pacific, it's it's more than I think almost 200 meters different from what it is off our coast. You know, and I'm talking about right now. You know, over that distance, sea level defined using the geoidal concept differs uh, by a couple hundred meters. It's over distances of 10,000 kilometers, so the gradient is very low, but that's a function of just the gravitational force, uh, you know, that's exerted by the distribution of land and water as it exists today. Well, a more dramatic one is across the Isthmus of Panama, of course. Yeah. But, but what is the sea level to which which is it's you know measurements in, in, are, it's a very good question in my mind it's just a comparative it's a relative uh, differencing that they're doing you know so they know exactly where they are in in two dimensional space so they're differencing pixels uh, across this two dimensional space so you know rather than worry about kind of uh, what is sea level which is a very very good point um, they're just differencing they're saying that there's a change over a particular John, this is a very provocative talk, and I um, appreciate the science a lot. I'm curious about your experience um, bringing the science to um, our government. I'm thinking of the current uh, government, both in BC and uh, federally, uh, seem hell bent on burning up all the um, oil sands, uh, uh, fossil fuel as fast as possible. And does this get through that um, you know, there's a relationship? Not really. Um, actually, Mark would probably be in a better position to comment on this than I would. But um, you know, we're one step removed from climate. You know, we're talking about sea level. And just my gut feeling about how they react to you know, the impacts of fossil fuels and you know, the relative importance of uh, the economic development benefits associated with them versus the environmental ones. I don't think they even thought they even you know under, would understand any of this. To be perfectly honest, I'm, so I'm what, a, I'm what a can you do? What pet. can you do to bring that into a realm where? Um, I mean, it's actually to me. I'm, I'm I'm a physician. I'm not that smart either, and I got it. 
Yeah, to me, it's really a scary secondary effect. Um, you know, and I, I, I would have to say there's a lot of uncertainty, but the trends are going to be there. And uh, the message that I would try to deliver is that it doesn't take much. You know, you don't need this four or six meter stuff. You're going to have large economic consequences and perhaps demographic consequences for, for something with it, even in the range of the conservative IPCC estimates. But as you know, you know there, there's a lot of people, particularly less scientists than, than the public, who don't believe any of that stuff. You know, they just refuse to believe that you know, we could possibly alter our atmosphere to the extent that it would affect climate. And it's a very, getting back to your original question, you know, I think you just have to kind of keep plugging away. You can't kind of give up. I mean, IPCC has done a very good job and um, you know they're coming up with a new, new assessment report, and I don't think this issue is going to go away. So, um, I suppose it requires convincing that the public that trends that we've observed are real, and they might uh, become exacerbated in the future. And also realizing that there are net, uh, there are no real benefits from it. A lot of people would think that there are benefits from a warmer climate, but globally there are no benefits. You know, on all on all scales. So. But that requires quite a bit of convincing and you know it's interesting this the pipeline debates that are occurring right now are kind of capturing this in a microcosm because it's kind of jobs versus the environment you know there's polarization around those issues you know why does it have to be that way you know why can't there be some sort of middle ground if you will or you know I think we ought to hold resource uh, companies to a higher standard in terms of capturing carbon. I mean, there's a lot of science that needs to be done on that. There's no guarantee that if we pump carbon into the ground, it's going to stay there, carbon dioxide. But at least, uh, and I know they are supporting some of this research, but I think uh, we can't let them, we got to hold them, you know, hold their nose to the, to the grindstone here and accelerate this whole thing because I think it, in the short term, it's going to be easier to capture carbon maybe than to, to reduce consumption of fossil fuels. Well, it's certainly easier to talk about capturing carbon than it is yeah. to do anything. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but Mark's the guy you should, who should really be handling that question. <laughs> I have a question that's uh, building on the last one. Do you think democracy as we know it is a robust enough system to absorb these data and cause change in time? <laughs> and if not, what's better? Uh, <laughs> geez, that's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Really, I hate, I hate to say it, but um, what would be your thoughts? I mean, you asked. I, I think you're being um, very accurate and factual, uh, except on the issue of politics. I've given up hope. I'm not upholding any hope whatsoever for Peter Kent, for, for Harper, for the pipeline inquiry at the National Energy Board. I think, it, I think it's going to take more than that. And I think people are going to respond to disaster more directly than at the ballot box. Yeah, well, I, I hate, I'd hate to see it have to come to that. The problem is that the, you know, it's not, these are uh, things that are locked in. You know, uh, even if we stopped uh, if we froze carbon dioxide emissions at their current level, uh, a lot of these changes are going to happen. You know, they're kind of built into the system. So uh, you kind of begin to think, well, adaptation, I hate to say it, but it's kind of how are we going to adjust to that and, and what sort of adjustments are we going to have to make? You know, and they're not, it's not a very rosy picture. You know, when you talk about lots of displaced people and uh, economic losses, you know, that's kind of, is that adaptation? That is adaptation, but it's kind of, uh, unfortunately, kind of not a very nice form of adaptation. Yeah. Um, you got an issue with uh, sea level rise. Um, so there's an issue in kind of the edges of continents, but what about, what about in the interior continents? I mean, um, that's something that's always bugged me, and I'm curious as if you know if you have any opinions about you know how global warming is going to affect precipitation or desertification. Uh, no, I, you know I shouldn't really go there. I, you know, in a sense, kind of that opens up the whole question of uh, climate impacts uh, on a regional scale. So, Jared, I, I'm going to dodge that question because it 
kind of uh, begs the issue of how climate's going to play out on a, on a regional scale, climate change. I'd like to bring this talk back to being a little more scientific as opposed to the uh, political aspect of it, because that's a debate that could go on forever. But one thing that strikes me is uh, when you were presenting some of the data about uh, geochem geochemical proxies for sea level and temperature, et cetera, et cetera, and I was wondering if you could uh, maybe shed some light on if there's errors involved in those. I mean, it's clear that there was nobody 100,000 years ago with a digital thermometer yeah, telling us to... Uh, we're, dealing, we're dealing with proxies. And sure, yeah. They have a lot of uh, uncertainty associated with them. Um, one of the uncertainty, geologists have to have chronology, you know, or geophysicists have to have chronology when they're dealing with these things. And so there's error in the chronologies. When you deal with ice cores, you have annual layers, but as you go back in time, the ice gets more and more compressed and you get more and more time captured in a lesser amount of ice. And so you, your uncertainty increases back when I'm talking about 400,000, 800,000, you know, I, I could only guess, but it might, in terms of chronology, it might be 10%, you know, that you could be off back then. Much less, though, when you're up in the upper parts of the ice cores the last 10, 20,000 years. Um, so that's one source of error. Uh, there's the assumptions that uh, underlie using 018, 016 ratios as a proxy for, for climate or sea level. Um, there's a certain assumption, you know, based on global averages and uh, you know, as to how the two, how that proxy really provide, how much it provides an accurate measure for climate or sea level. And I don't know what that uncertainty would be. Uh, I think it's relatively modest, but I'm not totally sure. And then the measurement errors are very low, actually, in the case of uh, 018, 016 ratios and carbon dioxide concentrations, they're fairly low. So I don't think that's a big source of error. It's, it's really kind of that temporal uncertainty and then the, uh, the fundamental underlying assumptions of using those as proxies. Carbon dioxide less so. The only thing that could screw that up is if you didn't have, if your air bubble was not a closed system, you know, and we're pretty sure that's not the case. They are closed system, these little air bubbles trapped in the ice. So they provide a very robust, repeatable, uh, measurement of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, subject to that temporal uncertainty. Uh, I totally agree with your concerns, of course, but I'd like to go back to the first example of catastrophic situation you presented about um, Pacific atolls, because yes. I'm, I'm interested in those systems a lot. Uh, I heard some ideas that since coral reefs are alive, uh, they could actually grow and adapt to sea level changes, uh, if those aren't too fast, of course. So I was wondering if maybe those systems were actually a lot less at risk than islands and the shoreline, and if you knew a little bit more about that. Okay, this is just my, uh, you know, I'm not a biologist, so, but I like, uh, I, I never fear like angels to tread and uncertainty, but um, my feel, first of all, the coral, the coral reefs are under stress too, due to uh, rising temperatures in, in tropical waters. So there's an issue around how healthy they are, how they can react to rising sea levels. And my guess is if we're talking about um, sea level rises of the magnitude that are predicted for the, that the, they can't, they can't keep up with that. But that Ralph Matthews is here, I know there's probably some biologists who would say, can a coral reef build up uh, in equilibrium with rising sea levels? My guess is no, but... Uh, yeah, they're, they're totally unhealthy. Yep. Uh, what percentage of carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere? And is there any measurement as how fast is it increasing? Obviously, carbon dioxide is also absorbed at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's the measurements that are made are made on you know the atmosphere, uh, not only in Hawaii but in other places, and uh, so it's 390 parts per million on average. There's seasonal differences in in carbon dioxide concentrations, but they're very small. Um, so right now it's 390 parts per million which I, if I'm doing my arithmetic right, that's 
0.4 parts per thousand. Now that's a small amount, but of course we're talking about gases that are, um, you know, in small amounts uh, have a tremendous impact. Methane is uh, a much more potent greenhouse gas, but it occurs in far smaller concentrations, but it's also increasing. They can measure methane in the atmosphere as well. It is true that some carbon dioxide, of course, enters the ocean, um, and some of it, I'd have to think about that, but there are other ways. It's sequestered by vegetation, uh, but on average, the bottom line is the concentration is increasing the atmosphere, so the sinks are not keeping up with kind of the sources, if you want to put it that way. So I, I recall reading a couple of years ago, you know, some archaeological studies where they were talking about people coming down these coasts at a time when the sea level was, if I remember right, it was like 90 meters lower, something. Yeah. And I think I think that's still a quite a bit lower a rate of change than what you're talking about artificially. But is it something that, I mean, do you, do you try to take that into account that there's some uh, I mean, like, what would be happening if we didn't oh, do anything? Oh, you mean that you know? being totally natural, in a sense, you know, that you do get, that was kind of the, the kind of, uh, maybe not, I didn't make it not, very clearly. Could it be but, totally natural, but what would be the, nat the is there some kind of unnatural uh, change? I mean, I, I don't know what drove it to, to yeah. make Well, that like would be ice, meters. you know, variations in, in the amount of ice largely on Earth. You know, there was much more ice on Earth, so sea levels were lower. And yeah, off our coast, uh, you know, that's, uh, it was a hypothesis that came out of a department in this university. Knut Fladmark suggested that uh, early peoples moving into the Americas uh, essentially moved along the coast rather than through uh, the traditional route of the so-called ice-free corridor. And it is very true that uh, at the time there were people uh, kind of crossing the Bering Land Bridge, that, that landmass, that there was much more uh, dry land off our coast that could have possibly been used as a corridor for people. So that idea came out of this university as the first one. And I'd say there still is a kind of a lively debate about that whole issue. But I guess, you know, at those times, sea level uh, would have been rising at rates that I have to think about it, but it would probably exceed current rates. And that's just due to the very unusual idiosyncratic melting of these ice sheets. Um, but these are ice sheets that no longer exist. So uh, the issue would be, can our current ice sheets sort of create rates of that magnitude? But current rates aren't probably as high as they would have been sort of during that time, about say 10,000 years ago, because of the very rapid uh, disappearance of the ice sheets um, related to you know, other phenomena than what I've been talking about. You know, it's kind of a larger scale uh, fluctuation of climate related to the growth and decay of ice sheets. Well, let us thank our speaker once more. Thank you.